Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Friday Ramblings. It's Friday. We ramble about entertainment. That's what we do because what better thing is there to do in life than help people discover new entertainment or be reminded of the things they loved in years past. Speaking of years past, we're going to discuss the two versions of an all-time great caper film. That's right, this is a two-for-one. Why? Because I'm generally not the biggest fan of remakes, but this is a case where I'm going to allow it. Partly because, bear with me, the remakes were actually done for good reason and with a good stretch of time in between them. This was not a case of Studios panicking because oh my god we gotta put a mo we gotta put another movie in this franchise out to keep the rights to it but uh we really don't have a plot idea for a sequel screw it we'll just do a remake and call it good enough or hey we're bored we don't have any original ideas uh let's remake this movie we just made five years ago not that nonsense no 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 my friends you see we are discussing. The Italian Job. And The Italian Job had a good, lovely, oh, look at this, mm, mwah, lovely 34-year gap between films. And more importantly, the original one was actually a British film that did migrate over to America, whereas the second one was made in America. This is not a case of the same studio just going, eh, why not? It's been a few years. Two different countries, two different complete generations tackling the same basic plot idea from two completely different directions while still staying in the same genre. So let's get to work. It's time for a heist or two. Or maybe the same heist twice. Is that still two heists? Or is it one heist that's twice as nice? The original version of the Italian Job is a 1969 British comedy caper film written by Troy Kennedy Martin and produced by Michael D. Lee, directed by Peter Collinson, and starring Michael Caine, Noel Coward, Benny Hill, Raph Valone, Tony Beckley, Rosano Brazzi and Maggie Bly. The film's plot centers around cockney criminal Charlie Croker, recently released from prison, who forms a gang for the job of stealing a cache of gold bullion being transported through the city of Turin, Italy in an armored security truck. Specifically, this is done because Croker finds out that the veteran British thief that he was going to work the job with, Roger Beckerman, was killed shortly before Charlie got out of prison, and the widow insists that he continue her late husband's plans, which he had completed before his death, wanting to heist what was then valued at $4 million in gold bullion, intended as a down payment to the Fiat um, automobile manufacturer by China for a car factory. You with me? Good. Now, the iconic soundtrack was composed by the great Quincy Jones, featuring the songs On Days Like These, sung by Matt Monroe over the opening credits, and the Self-Preservation Society, or Get a Bloom and Move On, during the climactic car chase scene which featured Kane among its varied singers. Film runs for 99 minutes, had a budget of three million, and made bank at the box office. But more importantly, and this is key, that 
Its success also earned it critical acclaim amongst critics for the performances by Michael Caine and Noel Coward, as well as the film's reflection of British culture from the period and the film's climactic car chase becoming one of the most iconic in Western cinema. Not just British cinema, cinema, but even iconic by American film standards. The Italian Job became a cult symbol of British filmography and was ranked favorably in the top 100 British films by the British Film Institute and featured one of the most infamous endings in cinema, which in a rare step away from our minimal spoilers policy, we're going to go ahead and throw at you. After securing the gold, the crew begins celebrating, but the coach they're transporting the gold on loses control and teeters over a cliff with the gold balancing over the edge. Croker, played by Michael Caine, soon contemplates how to save the crew and the gold, which is sliding farther away down the vehicle, the closing seconds of the film being Michael Caine claiming, hang on a minute lads, I've got a great idea. Thus, the film ends on a metaphorical cliffhanger while they are literally hanging off a cliff. <laughs> it is the ultimate pun that also leaves just enough audience interpretation to be enjoyable without being aggravating. Which sums up most of the film. It is a caper film, but it also has plenty of comedy in it, both elements being balanced beautifully by the crew, both on-camera and off-camera crew. Now, besides being referenced in various TV shows, including The Simpsons and MacGyver, the film itself later gained a video game adaptation in 2001 being uh, published on the PlayStation to European markets first and later to American markets. The game features a story mode based on the film and a multiplayer party mode where players compete through several different circuits in London and Turin as well as a single player practice mode where the players can develop their skills needed for completing the story mode. The game features representations of London and Turin that the player can drive around freely within a sandbox mode in a range of cars including the iconic Mini Coopers used in the climactic chase scene. Now, one more little bit of inspiration the original film gave and then we'll get into the remake. The original film also inspired an annual fundraising event starting in 1990, which is, features a car, car race, the run taking place during late October and early November, involving the Minis and other cars driving from UK to Northern Italy and back. Now, a wide variety of Minis have participated in the modern day race ranging from models built as early as 1959, the first year of production of the Mini, to the brand new BMW Minis, as well as many others, including derivatives. Other vehicles featured in the original film or their modern derivatives are also eligible to participate. It is good times. Initial charities supported were Childline and BBC Children in Need. By 1992, the main beneficiary charity had switched to the NSPCC, aka the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, who were supported for a total of eight years. In 2000, the Italian job organizers moved their support to what was then known as the NCH Action for Children, and from 2008 to 2011, the event supported Kids Out, a Bedfordshire-based national grant giving children's charities before moving its support again to 2012 to Verity, the children's charity, 
an organization founded in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1927, reigning with Verity until 2017. 2018, the Italian job charity moved their support to Buttle UK, formerly known as the Frank Buttle Trust, raising over £92,000 for their Chances for Children grant. Uh, the last race was run in 2019 and has been patroned by Sir Michael Caine, John Cooper, Sir Harry Seacombe, and Robert Powell. Which is good times. Anytime something can inspire people to raise large amounts of money for excellent charities, that gets our thumbs up. In fact, you know what? It's children's charities almost exclusively, that's two thumbs. Two dancing thumbs. Yay for children. Yay for children's charities. Woo. So this brings us to the American remake. In 2003, director F. Gary Gray, based on a screenplay by Donna Powers and Wayne Powers, and producing by Donald DeLine, brought us the new iteration of the Italian job. Now this plot, instead of being based around stealing a shipment from a regular, you know, shipping from one person to the other, as it was intended to be, this instead is based off a motley crew of thieves planning to steal gold from a former associate who double-crossed them. Gray himself refers to the film as, as an homage to the original. The film was mostly shot on location in Venice and Los Angeles, where canals and streets were shut down during printable photography. It was distributed by Paramount Pictures and grossed over $176 million worldwide against a budget of $60 million. Critical response was largely positive, with publications comparing it favorably to the original film while highlighting the action sequences, performance of the cast, and humor. A sequel was teased at one point called The Brazilian Job, but the sequel was subsequently canceled before getting very deep into development. So who's in the new Italian job? Mark Wahlberg, Charlize Theron, Edward Norton, Jason Statham, Seth Green, Mos Def, and Donald Sutherland. That is a pretty good cast. In this version, professional safe cracker John Bridger, played by Donald Sutherland, leads a team that steals $35 million worth of gold bullion from a safe in Venice from Italian gangsters who had stolen it weeks earlier. Charlie Croker, played by Mark Wahlberg, is the professional fixer, basically the strategist and Bridger's apprentice. Bridger himself referring to Charlie Croker as the son he never had. It also features computer hacker Lyle, Wheelman Handsome Rob, Inside Man Steve, and Explosive Expert Left Ear. However, after a successful heist, Steve double-crosses them as they drive towards Austria. With another crew, he takes the money for himself and kills John Bridger. Handsome Rob drives the van over the bridge into the water to protect the others using air tanks they use in the heist to stay alive under the water until Steve and his crew left, assuming that they either drown or froze as this was being done during a very cold time of year. A year later, Charlie finds Steve under new identity, laundering the gold to finance his lavish lifestyle in Los Angeles. Charlie gathers the team, adding to it John's estranged daughter Stella, played by Charlize Theron, a skilled private safe expert, offering the chance to avenge her father's death. 
so good times. The majority of the film from this point shows off like any good caper film. The crew staking out Steve's mansion, figuring out exactly how they are going to heist the gold, as well as humorously interacting with each other, including computer expert Lyle's insistence that he was actually the man who invented the infamous file sharing service Napster and that the publicly recognized and in real world straight up legitimate inventor was his college roommate and stole the program from Lyle while he was sleeping at his desk hence calling it Napster. It's a running joke throughout the film. But Steve figures out the crew is in town and tries to outsmart them first by trying to convince Charlie there's a lot less gold left than there really is and then that further trying to win the day by moving the gold from the house that they had come up with the perfect plan to heist it from causing the crew to change gears and have to turn their plans into much like the original film a heist on the road this is where a lot of the action sequences really take place and they are incredibly well done the crew uses three he heavily modified mini coopers in a loving homage reference to the first film and its inclusion of minis. Various other um, local criminals are involved in supplying resources and helping gather information on what Steve has been doing, playing smaller roles in setting up the grand heist finale. Now, again, we're not going to go into too many specific details because I do want to give you just enough to tantalize you, not make you feel like you know enough to not have to see the movie. But, needless to say, over the course of the movie, because it is an American big Hollywood movie, Stella and Charlie find themselves growing romantically attracted to each other as they work through their issues, including Stella feeling that her father always cared more for Charlie than his actual flesh and blood child as well as the various characters having reunited and playing off each other and everybody's varied feelings of Steve's a jackass and let's be honest Steve is played by Edward Norton and Edward Norton is a superb actor who plays this creepy, amoral, self-centered jerk perfectly. Steve comes off as a guy who is always looking to be stabbed in the back because he is well aware he has stabbed more than one person in the back over the course of his life. His entire life has been lying to people and pretending to be somebody he's not. Thus, he is always afraid somebody's going to find out the truth and take from him what he does not deserve to possess to begin with. Especially once he knows his old crew is back in town and looking for him. This level of paranoia perfectly contrasts with Charlie's careful, meticulous planning, making the two flip side of the coins from each other. And of course, anybody who has seen any film Jason Statham is in knows Jason Statham's a fun time. But, when it's all said and done, good things happen. I'm not going to give you super spoilers on this one because they did not remake the cliffhanger that is about hanging off a cliff style ending. It is a much more classically set in stone Hollywood happy ending but still a very good one that feels like the perfect payoff to the movie good times good times 
F. Gary Gray won a Film Life Movie Award for Best Director at the 2004 American Black Film Festival. Clay Cullen, Michael Caines, Gene Paul Regret, and Mike Massa won an award for Best Specialty Stunt at the 2004 Taurus World Stunt Awards for the boat chase through the canals of Venice from the heist that opens the film, and the Italian job was nominated for the 2003 Saturn Award for Best Action Adventure Thriller Film, but ultimately lost to Kill Bill. In April 2009, IGN named the film's Los Angeles chase sequence one of the top 10 car chases of the 21st century. The film has been released on DVD, HD DVD, and Blu-ray disc. Criminologist Nick, Nicole Rafter saw the Italian job as part of a revival of the heist film genre around the start of the 21st century, along with the remake of The Thomas Crown Affair and the remake of Ocean's Eleven. And in describing his theory of a team film genre, film scholar Dr. Jeremy Strong writes that the Italian job could be categorized such, along with classics like The Magnificent Seven, The Great Escape, The Dirty Dozen, and in more recent years, The Usual Suspects and Mission Impossible. The use of BMW's then new line of retro-styled minis in the film was mentioned by critics and business analysts alike as a prime example of modern product placement, now known more specifically as brand integration. Something that is very key in films made, being made currently, Italian Job was one of the first to do it in an awesome manner because not only did the cars feel well used in the film, and not shoehorned in, but they were an homage to the films used in the icon or cars used in the iconic chasing from the original film. So it was perfect integration. Business Week reported that sales of the Mini in 2003, the year in which the Town Job was theatrically released, increased 22% over the previous year. Now, as we said, the studio was interested in making a sequel to the Italian job. The initial one, they never finalized the script, and after pushing the date back multiple times, it was quietly canceled. It was later said, a few years later, that by Seth Green, that with Paramount's hierarchy having changed hands four times, it seems that a sequel is not a priority for the studio, and thus not to put too much heart into or hope into seeing it. Producer Donald DeLine later revealed that a script for the so-called Brazilian job had been developed and budgeted, but a lot of things were happening with various management changes and it got tabled. Later he clarified that we had a version at Paramount that we're talking very seriously about. The cast was interested in the project. However, Gray said that while he enjoyed making the Italian job and hoped that he would still be interested to write the sequel if the script became finalized, it would be dependent upon scheduling. Ultimately, the final word was in 2010 where it was said that the Brazilian job isn't happening. It just keeps getting rolled over by Paramount. What can I say? Still, it is one of those things that the fans keep hoping and begging for. So, who knows? Maybe if we wait long enough, in another 36 years, maybe we'll be due for another remake of The Italian Job. That would be, let's see, 2039? Hey, we only got 16 more years to wait. Can you last? If it's as good as the remake, and made with as much love and appreciation by everybody involved, hey, I can hold out. Still, I highly recommend seeing both films. You will be able to spot where the homages were made 
and where they felt free to make the, the newer movie their own, as well as they're both being excellent examples of the caper slash heist genre and what ensemble cast movies can do when done very well. So, we're going to sign off with a quick stay happy, stay healthy, stay entertained, and come back every Friday for another rambling. I am the Bardic One. I ramble. I entertain. And I appreciate everybody who chooses to view the Roulette Productions channel. Bye-bye.